started. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to the keynote event for the second annual ComSciCon Virginia Tech. We are so happy to have you all here today. My name is Susan Chen. And I'm Stephanie Edwards Compton. And we are the organizing committee co-chairs for this year's ComSciCon event. So we first wanted to make the audience aware that this event is live captioned. Um, we have a QR code on the flyers that are outside the wall if you would like to pull those up on your phone. For those of you that are watching the live stream, um, you can also do that with this link here. Um, we were unable to get <laughs> fixed with YouTube. That's why I was on the phone just now because I was trying to get the YouTube captions correct. But they are on that separate file. And then once the live caption and this live event is done, we'll be able to add those captions in so that the Event will be accessible. Um, we also just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, the indigenous people that have lived on this land before us and that who those are the traditional custodians of this land and the um, in which we work and live and we recognize that they're continuing connection to the land and water and air that we continue to use as an institution. And um, we also want to pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and we wanted to honor the enslaved persons who lived and worked on this site and contributed to the creation of the original educational institution. All right, we'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this event, because without them, none of this would have happened or have been possible. So the event is sponsored in part by 4VA, a collaboration partnership for advancing the Commonwealth of Virginia. Also, big thanks to the College of Science, the Virginia Tech Graduate School, Fralin Life Sciences, and the Institute for Society, Culture, and Environment for their contributions. And lastly, we'd also like to thank the Department of Psychology and the Department of Human Nutrition, Foods and Exercise, um, Cyto Recovery, and Jack Wardell Videography. And so a big thank you for you all for being here today. And a big thank you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Regina Nizzo, um, and Provost Clark, who will be introducing her. So hand it to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It uh, is indeed a pleasure to have this opportunity to welcome you here to uh, what is uh, sure to be a very interesting presentation this evening. And so um, I am indeed pleased to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Center for Communicating Science. And as you just heard, this is a, uh, the kickoff event of the ComSciCon, which is uh, the Communicating Science Conference, which is a conference that is planned by graduate students Apparently four graduate students. However, as I look through the audience, I identify a number of colleagues who uh, indeed have gone through the graduate experience, but probably some years ago. <laughs> um, so it is a special privilege um, that we have with us this evening, Dr. Regina Nusa. And uh, um, Dr. Nusa, I can tell you that the title of your presentation grabbed my attention and captivated me. I mean, how else can it happen when you have a title that reads, Connecting 21st Century Information to Stone Age Brains, Numbers, Uncertainty, Surprise, and More. The Stone Age brain was the one that got me because I recognized that that's pretty much what's inside this cranium. <laughs> but that was too elevated a consideration of what's actually inside this cranium because I came to appreciate, once I used the Stone Age brain a little perhaps, that the Stone Age brain is, in fact, a very sophisticated and well-developed machine. And uh, when I started to think along those lines, that became uh, important because it started to connect me with so much of what Virginia Tech is actually doing right now. Let me give you another example that perhaps serves as a parallel interest here. You know, we've been thinking about building, uh, more than thinking about, we're implementing plans to build a new campus in Northern Virginia one that initially is really focused on computer science and computer science education and research. But in fact, what we're doing there is we're using computer science as a framework actually to wrap around a much broader application that really has its focus on, on humans, human cyber networks. But in the context of trying to understand this relationship between what it means to be a person, the humanity of us, and the technology. So this notion that, that you know, technology has effects on humanity, or that the science that we conduct starts with a science and has to be communicated is the wrong way of thinking about it. Because ultimately, if we start with the humanity in the design of the technology, or we start with the person in the context of understanding that people engage 
in stories and with stories will be in a better position in terms of understanding the science. So, uh, this, this is really interesting. So, let me tell the audience something about you before I get too engaged in trying to make a presentation <laughs> myself. Um, Dr. Nuzo has uh, served on the faculty of Gallaudet University uh, uh, since 2006 and she serves as a senior advisor for statistics, communication, and media innovation for the American Statistical Association, where she helps improve communication of statistics policy issues. There are a number of statisticians in the audience, no surprise, okay? Um, you, you bring statistics to journalists and journalism, and by that I interpret that you work in the context of your science to help inform us on how to tell the story of what we do in an engaging way. You have written for the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, ESPN, uh, the magazine, Reader's Digest, Scientific American, New Scientist, Science News, and Nature. That's a pretty good spectrum of scholarship and publications. Congratulations. And you earned a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering at the University of South Florida, and you have a PhD in statistics uh, from, from Stanford. So, Connecting 21st century information to Stone Age brains. You have my attention. Thank you. I'm going to try to use this lapel mic so I can walk around. Is that on? Can you tell that's on? Awesome. Thank you so much for the invitation. So, Susan, Stephanie, thank you so much for the invitation for this. I'm so excited to attend the event tomorrow. And I was trying to imagine what it is in my head. I'm picturing this whole event and this whole center to be. And I realize it's like those uh, dog parks, you know, where you have the dogs or pups running around and they have their zoomies and their tippy taps and their playing fetch and they're drooling on each other and they just have this joy, this sheer joy from being around all these other awesome creatures that get you, you know? So that's what I, I'm picturing tomorrow to be like. So <laughs> whether or not there are actual pups, I'm picturing it as a giant in a dog park. And I think it's, it's incredible that Virginia Tech is supporting this kind of thing. I mean, you're very lucky to have administrators behind you, Patty, Carrie. You know, the Center for Communicating Science, I can say, after having been out in the world a bit, is really unique in its goals, its mission, and its approach, its methods. So anyway, thank you so much for the, the invitation and a chance to come and speak with all of you. So. This is a nice, cozy audience. Um, this is sweet. I was picturing something bigger. So, um, <laughs> no, not, not in a bad way. I, I like the cozy. Um, figure out where to stand. Um, so maybe I can get an idea who all of you are. OK, raise your hand if you're a graduate student. Ah, OK. So, what, three quarters? Uh, who identifies, if you're not, the remaining um, as a scientist? Who identifies as a scientist? Or data scientist? Okay, right, I see that. Um, a clinician? What about clinician? Anyone here? Okay, very important. Can I? Clinician scientist, right? There we go. Get both of those. Uh, any other categories? Um, communicator. Communicator! Oh, <laughs> those! <laughs> Um, any statisticians here or data scientists? Oh, represent. All right, we got we got a couple going on there. Eh, all right. Um, okay. So so that's uh, that's good. So if um, before I talk about actually communicating science and statistics, uh, if it's okay, I'm going to share a personal story about myself. Can you even see that? Okay, this is Picard, and he's part of the Borg now. So I am a cyborg. Um, I am a almost five-year-old 
cyborg, still learning about the cyborg community and learning how to play cyborg games and learning all about the world. And really, a cyborg, except not like this, uh, more like this. So, uh, let me pause and ask, can you, is the resolution okay or should we dim the lights a little bit? Okay. I think I was, I was picturing a larger auditorium that was uh, slightly, okay, I wanna, oh, now I, now I can't see you quite as well. <laughs> All right, we'll do that. Okay, so this, this kind of cyborg. So I was born half deaf and cochlear implant. I was born half deaf. Um, the kind where I could hear low frequencies, but not high frequencies. So the bottom half of a piano, but not the top. The vowels, but not the consonants. And it's a little unusual type of hearing loss, an unusual type of deafness, because it's, it's literally almost half deaf. There were sounds that I heard close to normal, and then all of a sudden it dropped off. So while you had a world that was this big, I had a world that was this big, that only existed up until here. And uh, this is why I was able to learn how to speak if you have the, the vowels and lip reading. I was able to put it all together. So I didn't learn sign language until I started teaching at Gallaudet. And that was wonderful to be part of the deaf community and teach statistics in ASL. Let me tell you, not, <laughs> not easy. Um, but I was losing hearing with every, every passing year. And it was just getting more difficult to connect to people out in the hearing world, out in the larger world. And I was really curious about that half of the world that I had never experienced. There was so much there, birds and, and beeps and you know the, the sound of the letter S. So uh, almost five years ago, at the age of 43, I went and got a cochlear implant. So after a lot of research, and a lot of fretting and a lot of waiting. I got a cochlear implant one year. So this is me day after surgery, which is a few weeks before it's activated, before it's turned on. And if you read my mind, um, I'm thinking this is going to be awesome. I love technology. And now I have a tiny brain computer. This is what I nicknamed it, tiny, tiny brain computer. Literally, a computer embedded in my skull, zapping my brain with electricity thousands of times per second, translating this complicated world of sound and vibrations into zeros and ones, and then zapping my brain directly. I mean, it's, it's amazing, right? Um, the only problem was, was it actually going to work? <laughs> It, uh, they can't, they actually can't predict it. And I had, I had no hearing in these, you know, in these frequencies. And so I had no way of telling. But in my, uh, you know, educated arrogance, I said, uh, you know, I'm smart, got a PhD, statistics, I've written for newspapers. Like, I'm smart, my brain will just figure it out. How hard can it be, right? And <laughs> <laughs> So this is, this is real imagery of me when they activated this. Um, it was so hard. It was the hardest thing I'd like, ever had to do. And it, I, I learned it wasn't about smarts. You know, I was going in thinking, I'm just going to be able to think my way through this. I can study, just like it's an exam. It, it doesn't work that way. My brain did not know how to process this information. It was just so new that it, it just didn't know what to do. It, at first, it scrambled everything, which was really bizarre. So if you would knock, so I, I knew you know, what knocking sounded like before, but after, right when they turned it on, that sounded like bells. Everything gets frequency shifted. Uh, I saw a, a burly man on the subway and he was talking uh, and it came out something like Tinkerbell, or like I imagine Tinkerbell. I mean, it was hilarious. I, I had to laugh. Um, so it scrambles everything. It just doesn't know what to do. It's taking all the information. It was working. It was just my brain didn't know how to deal with all of this. And sometimes, which is even stranger, it would just do its best and then give up. 
So the first time I heard an S sound, so I never heard an S sound, which is why sometimes I pronounce it properly and sometimes I don't because I have to figure out just from lip reading. The first time I heard it with, the, with Tiny turned on, um, I heard nothing, complete silence, except I felt and saw a bright white uh, needle threading itself through my brain. I, I, I'm at a loss for words to describe this sensation, but my brain had remapped. It had all this, this auditory cortex that wasn't being used for anything, and so it said, all right, the visual, tactile, somatosensory stuff, that's what it's gonna be, and so now, all of a sudden, everything was scrambled, and it was coming through in this really bizarre way. So, um, it's kind of beautiful how my brain was saying, okay, you got information coming in, we're gonna do our best, we're gonna connect it to something that's familiar, and for me, that was the visual world. So I had this synesthesia. So it was, um, you know, it was beautiful and it was lovely, but um, it was also quite weird and frustrating, okay? Also, um, real image. so it felt like I had a brain I wanted, and... <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn how to love this derpy, <laughs> this, yes, this derpy brain um, that I got instead, right? This is how it felt like, what is happening? Other people, it worked so well, and then for me, I was getting these bizarre things. So why am I digressing with this story? Some of you already figured out brains are weird. Brains are just really weird. Whether it's taking in information through this uh, very, very different uh, format, modality, um, or whether we're trying to communicate complicated information to people. We can't just throw it at them. We can't just say, okay, you need to be smart enough. You need to work on this. Also, real communication, the sort of honest, clear communication is just so precious that we can't take it for granted. We shouldn't take it for granted. And this isn't about uh, dumbing things down. I know that they often say with science communication, oh, you, I just need to make it easy for people to understand. It's not about that. It's about learning about your audience, about the brains at the other end, learning how to connect it with things that are familiar to them, learning how to um, put it in the proper context. So you're right, Stone Age brains are very sophisticated, so how can we in some ways, that, that's still what we have. And so my Stone Age brain, when it was being zapped with electricity, said, no way. I was able to um, learn to think it through. So when I, I felt a certain, um, a certain explosion of light in my head, I knew that there was a sound in the eighth octave somewhere in the universe around me. And, and that's literally how I, I just learned to map it. You know, good statistician, I, I had a notebook where I map the different sensation, trying to understand. But I wanted to feel it. I wanted to feel these things. And I think it's the same way with communicating scientific information. We can teach them. Yes, we can sit down and explain it logically. But sometimes we want that shortcut, right? That we want to embed it in their experience. So not easy, but not impossible. So when I think about communicating uh, science and especially quantitative information, so which I'm calling quantcom as a nod to SciCom, these are the five landmarks that I think about. Numbers, evidence, uncertainty, surprise, and bringing it back home to the here and now. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today, but first, for those of you that are saying, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't come for a statistics lecture and you're thinking about sneaking out the back right now, um, why, why am I talking about statistics? Statistics is the grammar of science. And just like we use grammar to be able to tell the story, it doesn't mean we need to focus on the grammar. You can study the grammar if you want, but we're using the grammar to be able to tell a better story. It's the same thing with statistics. I'm going to make the argument here that by using statistics and quantitative information, you can tell a better science story along the way. And now for those of you who are saying, eh, I don't like, 
I don't like statistics, okay? If statistics is the grammar of science, are we going to be talking about regressions and eigenvalues? No, we're not. The equivalent level of grammar that you need for this talk is um, the low I can has stats. That's it. So don't sneak out just yet. All right, first one. Let's talk about numbers. I love this quote, Daniel Kahneman. No one ever made a decision because of a number. They need a story. And this is so true. So the plural of anecdote is data, right? So it's like we start with the observations, all right? That got a little bit of a reaction. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll inquire why afterwards. We, we start with the anecdote, the observations in the real world, and then we generalize out to the data. And, and this is what we need to do. We're not going to make decisions based on just a couple of stories. But we're hardwired to understand and love and listen and pay attention to stories. So somehow we need to then translate those data back into stories without losing the essence of the data and still giving us some particularity. OK, so not, not easy. Luckily, our sense of numerosity is very, very old. So this is fascinating. I love this. Apparently, the words that we use for one, two, three, and four are among the most conserved across time and all languages, dating back tens of thousands of years, went to even more so than mother and father. This tells you how important these concepts are that, that we've hung on to them and we've not changed them, even when we had fingers that we could use. No, these, these uh, number words are so important. So um, the, the fellow who studied this at uh, University of Reading told the New York Times, um, if you were to find yourself transported back to the time of the ne Neanderthals 15,000 years ago, and you were to run into uh, a handsome young man and use the word two, that in an odd, coarse way, you would be understood. Isn't that amazing? I love that. He said, that should astonish us. And it does. I mean, it, it gives me goosebumps. So then if numerosity is so deeply embedded in us, how can we explain this? <laughs> <laughs> you don't need a statutory uh, to see. Something's a little wrong with this pie chart here. <laughs> It's not just, there are many from Fox News. It's not just Fox News, so this is not a political statement. This is what we see. Now, this is interesting because research has shown that when we encounter percentages, there's some part of our brain that wants to count them as if they're discrete items. And so when you think about it that way, it's not surprising that they're not going to add up to 100 because they're not parts of a whole. They're things. We want them to be embodied things in our environment. OK, so that explains this. Let's um, pop quiz. This is actually not a pop quiz. This is a gut quiz. How about that? Suppose I were to ask you or tell you that early detection with mammography reduces the risk of dying of breast cancer by 25% and assume that 1,000 women aged 40 and older participate regularly in screening, how many fewer would die of breast cancer? So I, I know a few you are know, thinking, I want to calculate in my head. I need some more information. What are my, what are my variables here? What do you think? What is, it, what is your gut think? And it doesn't need to be a precise answer. Just something close enough. So I'm going to give you a moment to check in with your gut and what you think this would be. How many fewer of those 1,000 women would die of breast cancer with regular screening with a risk reduction of 25%? Ready? It's OK. I'm not going to crawl on you. All right, correct answer, one. So if you were, if you were close, Congratulations, good. You've got a good gut and a good gut for numbers. If you weren't close, you're not alone. So when they asked this of um, a thousand, I think it was a, um, where is it? 
uh, a thousand uh, German um, citizens, uh, representative sample, and Americans. This is what they answered. So this is fine. Anything less than 100, I, I don't need one to be the answer. That's fine. Just something in the ballpark, the magnitude. Notice, though, how many people? 500, 600, 998. So what does this tell me? Does it make me angry? No. But we cannot simply sit back, point our fingers at other people, and say, we just need to teach them better. That we need to improve quantitative literacy, and we need to have more, st I mean, we do need more stats classes. But <laughs> if so many people are getting it wrong, we need to try to understand why. What's going on in their brain? Their brain has a difficult time with this. Yet this is how we're giving the public information with this risk reduction. OK, so let's take what we talked about just a moment ago to see if we can do something better. All right, on the left, I use risk reduction. So I use 21% here. It's a slightly updated number. Same idea. On the right, I've restated it. Researchers estimate that over a 15-year period, chances of dying of a woman dying of breast cancer, if she's not screened, 0.52%. That number will drop to 0.41% with regular screening. I'll ask you, what do these two um, tell you in your gut? You're getting different feeling from these, right? So granted, this has information that you cannot simply get. You cannot unravel that 21% and get this. I went back to the original study. Uh, reshape the information to be able to give this. This is nice. So research shows that we need those absolute risks as well as relative risks to be able to make a good judgment. So when I, I show this to people, um, they say, oh, this is horrible. You can't show them that because it makes it seem like mammography doesn't do anything and that they're not going to die of breast cancer and so they won't come out and get their screening, which I, th I think is very interesting. They're thinking about their audience, but they're thinking about it persuasively rather than letting the story tell itself and letting people make that decision on their own. OK, so let's take this one step further. On the left, I've transported that 0 0.52, 0 0.41%. On the right, now I've said, OK, for every 10,000 women who are screened, 52 will die of breast cancer over 15 years compared to 41. So you're probably getting something different, right? A, a very different message. Just the same information, 5241, 5241. So research shows that these natural numbers, they resonate better with us. We're able to picture actual women in our environment. This is embodied quantification, what we have going on right here. So yes, this is more precise and compact, and it has fewer numerals, so I agree with that. And, and maybe some of you prefer this. But for a general audience, and even for yourself, I think for most people, this is telling a, a very different story, 52 and 41. All right. Can we go even further? So we have 10,000 here on the right. We have 1,000. And now it's 5 and 4. So yeah, I've lopped off the non-significant digits. There's intriguing research that shows we prefer tribe-sized denominators. So I think Facebook recently increased the number to 5,000 mm -hmm. able to have the number of friends. Anyway, um, I read something saying 750 is the average network size. And this is. A, like 200 to 1,000 is a typical tribe kind of size where you can actually know everyone. So this 1,000, I don't know about you, for me, it's a whole lot easier. I can imagine 1,000 women. 10,000, I'm, I'm thinking, OK, are they in a stadium? You know, what, what am I doing? 1,000, I can actually picture them. I can picture 5 and 4. I also have a harder time with 52 and 41. 
So if I need more help picturing this, there's these things called risk characterization theater. I think there's a little bit of a cultural bias going on. So this is a theater, you know, like a performing arts theater. So I'm not so sure this is going to resonate with, with younger people. But um, out of these thousand women, random, random women will die without screening, with screening. That one person will be saved. So I like these two together, right, with the, with the numbers and being able to see it and then making a decision about mammography. So if, if we feel like, okay, I want to save a little bit of ink, we can show them all, all in one graph. So moving on, you say, okay, this is great. I'm not a health scientist. That's fine. I've got geology for you. So I'm a little bit of a geology fangirl. And if you really want to melt your brain, so percentages are not the only thing that melts your brain. If you really want to melt your brain, then go over to the geology department. Any geology or earth scientist people here? OK. So I might get things wrong. All right, just a, just a disclaimer. So I love this. This is, this is so sweet. Like geologic time is just staggering, right? Not at the human scale at all. So that's why I was so excited to see this great thing. And it has you know what fossils you're seeing in each era. Um, totally wrong, but this is not to scale at all. Look at this. This doesn't help. This is not good. It's cute. It's sweet, but it's not giving me a true sense of geologic time. Okay, so like I said, geology fangirl, I wanted to go and I looked up what some of the highlights uh, were. 4.6 billion years ago, Earth begins. 541 million years ago, you had this explosion again. Apologies if I'm butchering this. Um, hard shelled life forms. Then we had a Permian extinction that killed off 90% of species about on Earth. Fascinating because we only think about the dinosaurs. Then the dinosaurs came in 66 million years ago. They were wiped out by that meteor, and then modern humans appeared 200,000 years. I don't know about you, but 540 million years compared to 4.6 billion, I, ca I can't tell. Yeah, I can subtract it. And maybe I can you know, come up with a ratio. But what does this feel like? I want to feel it. Here's what I like about geology. This is my single favorite uh, example of embodied quantification. If you were to lift your hands, your arms, and spread them wide, hold them out either side, think of the distance from fingertips. Fingertips is representing the Earth's entire history. You would have all the principal events in the palm of one hand. So the Precambrian that I talked about stretches from here all the way over to here. That 4.6 billion right there. So now look at this, the, the hand with the line of life. The Cambrian begins in the wrist. The Permian extinction, where 90% uh, became extinct right here. All of the Cenozoic is in the fingerprint. Okay, that's age of mammals. And in a single stroke with a medium grain nail file, you could eradicate human history. Like, I just, I don't know, I love this. I love this. There's something about it. It's just, it's terrifying and beautiful all at the same time. Now, that is embodied quantification, right? I feel it now. Somehow it's in my body. I can, I can get a sense of the scale now. Another way that you can use quantification numbers um, is your, your own personal life. So me going to be a cyborg, remember I said about, I had about half uh, my hearing. Um, so I calculated out the extra sounds that I was getting going from this to this um, would be about the same as you suddenly able to hear what a bat could hear. So before surgery, I kept trying to pick, what is it going to sound like? What? But can you picture what, like think of the highest pitch you can think of, and then think of n plus 1. Think of one more. You can't, right? That's why your brain kind of falls apart. It just, you don't have any experience with that. Anyway, this was an example of how 
without even using numbers or presenting numbers, you can give numbers in a human-centered analogy to be able to communicate stories to people. Okay, second one, evidence. So did you know the Matsis tribe in the Amazon, I think it's about 2,000 uh, people living there, they speak Matsis language that you cannot give a statement of fact in that language without saying how you know it. You have to choose a verb form that says what the evidence is. Did you, if you wanted to say that uh, you know, an animal had passed by, you cannot simply say, like I did, an animal passed by. You would have to say, did someone tell me? Or did I, did I smell it? Did I see the tracks? Um, what, how did I get this? So as I love this. You have to talk about your evidence. So uh, Guy Deutscher um, wrote about this. He's a linguist, wrote about this in a terrific book, Through the Language Glass. And he talked about how Matsy's man, if you were to ask him, how many wives do you have? He would have to say, to be honest, two the last time I checked because how, how does he know that in the last half hour one hasn't died or run off with another man? You would have to say, the last time I checked, I love this. You have to talk about your evidence. Like, wouldn't this be fabulous? Okay, some languages, this is evidentiality. This is what linguists call it. So some languages, it's baked in. You have to choose the verb form that talks about what your evidence is. Okay, English does not require this. <laughs> Just imagine <laughs> the world if we had to present evidence for everything. It would, the, yes, no politics. It's, it's interesting. So I, I understand that we're in a, a more complicated world where we can't just say, okay, I smelled the data, you know, I, I saw the data. Um, but it, it's very interesting. Some intriguing research has suggested that those languages that have the evidentiality built in are those with the smallest communities because it's in the smallest communities that trust is even more important. That you have to demonstrate trustworthiness and by always giving evidence for how you know something, you're being transparent. You're putting it right out there. So, just because it's hard in our modern language, I don't think we should give up. And in fact, I love this. How can we restore trust in science? Be worthy of trust. And then give evidence that you're trustworthy. So uh, Honora O'Neill, a British philosopher, has a great uh, TEDx talk and uh, some, some articles and a BBC News piece. She says, what matters is not the plaintive question, how can we restore trust, but the practical question, how can we make it easier to judge trustworthiness? And, and this is what we're doing when we're communicating in science, right? So what, what I think that, okay, this is not easy though. So I'm going to explain now the difference I found between communicating science and communicating quantitative information. This is communicating science. So I'm telling you about the great tasty chocolate cake and uh, the things I've found, the things I've discovered, right? The things I've learned about the world. And meanwhile, when I'm trying to communicate statistics, <laughs> I'm trying to say, no, 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 don't, don't look at the chocolate cake just yet. I want to tell you about my kitchen and my new baking pans and this oven and the recipe and of course it's hard. So this is empirical. This is the tasty, fun stuff, the end, right? The answers, the meat. Well, not the meat, the cake. This is a pastry. But we also should be transparent about our baking pans and our recipe. People do want to know this, at least make it available. How do we know this? So. Luckily, this is, this is a thing online. There's a subreddit called How Do We Know? There's a hashtag, HDWK. There's plenty of uh, Google autocompletes on that. People want to know, how do we know? Notice this is different than I'm going to explain how the science works 
you know, that like the biological mechanism. It's saying, how do we know this thing? Or, or if you're uncomfortable with the how do we know, um, why do we believe this? Or why are we acting right now as if this is the truth? Why? Why? How, how are we doing this? Steven Pinker, uh, cognitive psychologist, neurologist, um, has a terrific book about writing that I, I highly recommend, The Sense of Style. And he says that the hallmark of classic prose, the sort of writing that we're talking about, you have to show the reader something in the world. The writer can see something that the reader has not yet noticed, and he orients, orients the reader's gaze so she can see it for herself. So you're pointing to something happening. And so I say, tell an evident story. So we're OK with stories. We're OK with uh, mysteries and uh, you know, crime and detective. Let's do the same thing when we're talking about science to show that trustworthiness, to show how we know things. The sorts of things that I'm talking about, where did the data come from? How good are they? Um, what did they do in the study? Why did they design it this way? These sorts of things are so important. Rather than just jumping to the edge with the chocolate cake, we need to somehow put this in. And you say, OK, this isn't the fun stuff. You know, How can I do this? Well, NASA is doing exactly that. Climate change, how do we know? They're showing their trustworthiness by giving the evidence. And they have an entire page where they're just talking about the evidence for the lay public about why we believe this, why we know this. OK, fine, we're not doing public communication. Uh, popular science. Uh, this writer does a really nice job. This is a little bit of her specialty, where she breaks down stories and says, OK, it's hard to know this because we haven't randomized. There are lots of confounders, other factors associated. Maybe it's reverse. Um, causation, but they did this, this clever thing with genetics to prove causation. I love it. She's giving this backstory. So it's not just, OK, exercise is linked with depression. Trust me. No, no, no. Here's how we know it. And we're, yes, educating the public, but in a very uh, storytelling sort of way. This is by a, <laughs> this is by a, a friend of mine, a cartoonist. We've uh, collaborated on a cartoon together. And um, she's fabulous. She's a biology professor as well. And um, she had this, this re I encourage you to follow her reader stuff. She had a recent comic. She does narrative comics about her life as a mother and a biology professor. And this is about um, toys. Do we, do we have too many toys? What, what's the, What's the research say about this? So I've highlighted two uh, nice panels here. As a scientist, I'm always curious to know how studies are designed to reliably test questions. So I don't know if you know much about comic illustration. Every panel is precious. Every panel counts. And every word is so important. You don't throw it away. Like when we, when we write, we have lots of throwaways. No, so important. She took the time to do this. And then, look, she's talking about study design. In this study, each toddler experienced both conditions. And this is why the researchers could say fewer toys led to higher quality play, not toddlers. And so she's telling a little story here about confounders and experimental design. And you know, I think this is wonderful. So she and I have talked a lot about these, you know, these landmarks, these five landmarks. And she said that it's helped her. Um, realize that she needs to tell this sort of information even in comics where she doesn't have a lot of room. So if that's not your thing, there's also, this guy is fabulous. He has a PhD in some neurology sort of thing. So I don't know if you saw there was a, a piece in the Washington Post saying millennials are growing horns because they're always looking down on their smartphone. And um, whew, this, is, this is not a great study. Um, so what I loved about him is he said, OK, let's, let's talk about what the evidence. How do you know this? And then he picked a part. So he talked to me, a, a biostatistician, a, um, a different people, um, and wrote the entire article about, no, 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 wait, not so fast. They're not actually growing horns. Uh, and he, he got the um, nature 
it was a Nature Journal that published this study. Um, and he got the authors to um, retract some of the information. And I think the Washington Post said, OK, you know, we're sorry. We, uh, we take this back. So this is, people do like this. This is a little bit of a gotcha sort of journalism. But that's OK. But it does open you up to some problems. <laughs> Uncertainty, what, you mean it's not certain just because it's published in a journal? Like, what, what can we trust? So I'm fascinated by uncertainty. Did you know that um, we, that uh, as far as mathematics goes, analyzing probability, games of chance, came very late. We colonized the new world before we had good mathematical language to talk about probability. It's because it's hard. Our brains don't like uncertainty. And I'm convinced the way that we talk about it with our imprecise language, it just it makes everything harder. OK, for NIST. Some of you might say 50-50, and some of you might say, wait a minute, trick question 01, because it's already happened. Yet we talk about chance in the same way. right? So OK, now what if I look at it? Um, so now. It's a 0, 1 for me, but it's still a 50, 50 for her. But we're using, how can chance differ between people? Isn't, isn't this just a, a property of the situation of what's going on? How can, we're using the same word, chance, probability, likelihood. There are two, there are lots of sources of uncertainty. But I think when communicating this information, it's helpful to think about two sources, the universal kind, before I flipped it. It's random. Um, we don't know. It, it, you know, atomic decay. Or the personal, I don't know. She doesn't know because she hasn't seen it. I know because I have. So the personal or the universal. So keep that in mind. Here's another example to show how strange we are about probability. This is from. 538, um, 2016, what does it really mean to say that, let's say, 30% chance, he has a 30% chance of winning? If we were to repeat this experiment over and over, how does that work? If we were to repeat the election over and over? What, what does it mean to, you know, when I'm flipping a coin, I can say it's 50 50 because I know that it's going to come up half, but what does it mean when I'm talking about the election? But yet, what is, this 30% clearly means something. What, what does it mean? So Trevor Noah was very frustrated with this. Um, a lot of people were frustrated with this. This 30%, what do you mean? And called Nate Silver on, uh, this is right after, uh, yeah, this is right after the, the election 2016, and grilled poor Nate Silver about, uh, what do you mean 30%? It was, it was wrong. So it's interesting. I had a long conversation with a PhD in math who insisted that 30% was wrong, and I said that it's non-zero. So yes, he didn't win. 30, uh, he did win, 30% chance of winning, and then he did win. Um, so. Uh, as long as it's non-zero, then that's okay. It wasn't wrong, right? And she said, oh, no, no, no. So I said, all right, what if it were 40%? No, 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 that would still be wrong. So 49%? Like what? It was clear that she's just rounding up or down because our brains don't like this and we don't know how to deal. We, we just saw this as, as Nate's hedging, right? And so we rounded down and said, oh, Nate is saying no. No, he's not going to win. So Trevor Noah was not pleased about this. So this is two perspectives, I think, on uncertainty. Are we talking about uh, the, the population of something happening over and over? So if I'm talking about breast cancer, talking about a population, or am I talking about me? For me, it's a zero or one. Either I'm going to die of breast cancer or I'm not. There's no repetition of that experiment. Yes, it's other people, but I'm talking about me. So I um, love this simulation. So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to see how it works. I have a feeling it's not going to work because uh, my, my Wi-Fi was not great. This is fabulous on flowing data. So you put in uh, your gender, your age, and 
then it gives you, based on uh, mortality tables, a simulation, a ball will drop, uh, and it will, it will tell you your chances of, of dying at each age. And I love this because it makes it personal. It makes it personal. So yes, these are other people, but they're not really other people. They're me. They're other lives, right? They're, they're me, um, you know, when I didn't uh, look both ways before I crossed the crosswalk. So let me see uh, very quickly if I can uh, make this actually work. Yeah, probably not. Anyone who's in software development, if you can um, build in a nice uh, interface for websites and the PowerPoint, make a lot of money with that. Okay. So um, I encourage you to go and do this. I could just stare at it over and over and imagine all these different lives of myself. So this is where this repetition of an experiment, but it's an experiment on me. It's like this choose your own adventure books, and then you get to you know, rewind and go back to the beginning. So how can we talk about this then? Let's get back to the communication part. I say let's make an uncertainty sandwich. So brains don't like uncertainty. Start out with something that's certain, at least, you know? Cushion them into it. Talk about the different types of uncertainty. Don't just say, okay, uh, scientists aren't sure or more research is needed. Talk about why. I think people are able to understand why and they want to know why. Again, get into that story, that transparency, and then don't leave them hanging with that. Bring it back to another, another certainty, another nice slice of bread. All right, so an example on this from New York Times. The Ebola vaccine gives 100% protection. It has been shown to provide 100% protection. Uh, this sounds pretty authoritative, right? This is Ebola vaccine, not coronavirus. But uh, So let's see what the actual study said. 100% and then in parentheses, 95% confidence interval. Let's say it's 69 to 100. So when you see this shown to provide 100%, so a statistician called the New York Times uh, writer and said, no, that's not right. You can't say it, it gives 100% protection. And uh, the writer said, yeah, it does. It just says right here, it's 100%. And that stuff in parentheses doesn't really count, right? And it's just numbers over there. Uh, so obviously it didn't get retracted despite uh, a nice back and forth, but I love this because, I, you know, it wouldn't have been that hard. Two extra, two extra words. Mm -hmm. Gives protection in trial. Tell a story. What's that, what's that evidence story? Where's the uncertainty coming from? So I was delighted to see, she's not a statistician, she's a science writer at NPR, did exactly what I was looking for. Next, first Ebola vaccine likely to stop the next outbreak. So she's getting to what the important thing is. Um, now it looks like such a large outbreak is unlikely to happen again. So she's getting to what the important thing is. Then look at the biostatistician coming in. We were able to estimate the efficacy as being 100% in the trial. It's very unusual to have a vaccine that protects people perfectly. And then she takes a little bit of time here to explain why we don't know. She's explaining a confidence interval a little bit. Why don't we know exactly what it is? Why do we have these things in parentheses? It's clearly high, but not 100%. And um, so it's likely between about 70% and 100%. And it's lovely. This doesn't take that long. And I come away trusting this reporter in the study a whole lot more rather than this, this bang 100% uh, in the New York Times. Um, oh, she also, by comparison, so this uncertainty, okay, 100%, what does that mean? She brings it back into human terms. Okay, the flu vaccine is 50%. Few open questions. Now we're getting into more of the uncertainty. We don't know how durable it is. Again, specific examples rather than just more research is needed. We're not, you know, we're not completely sure. But then closing it with what is clear is the vaccine is likely to do what it needs to do. It's going to stop the outbreak. 
I feel, I feel comforted by this. And I think a lot of people will as well. And uh, Trevor Noah <laughs> was very, very unhappy with Nate Silva. I encourage you to watch this interview. It's great because Nate is, is groping around to try to find the words to talk about what, what we're talking about here. Where's the uncertainty? What's the, what's the evidence? How much of this is, is Nate's view? What does it mean to repeat you know, this, this election over and over? So, so what you like about the 2016 election, uh, people are now sitting up and paying attention to polls and data, right? And um, they do this because organisms only learn when events violate their expectations. And there were a whole lot of expectations that were violated for the 2016 election. People love to be surprised. Humans love to be surprised. And I wish that we could take advantage of that when we're communicating scientific information. So one strategy, the problem is I don't know, I don't know enough to be surprised. I don't know what my expectation is, so I can't tell if my expectation is violated. So first strategy, elicit expectations from your audience somehow. Ask them. So this is a lot of fun. It's recent on CNN. It asks you, what do you think are the most uh, useful ways, or the biggest effect on curbing climate change? And you rearrange these different cards, and then it tells you if you're right or wrong. So it asks for your expectation. Imagine this compared to a list saying, OK, top thing is this, then second, then third. You're saying, OK, but I don't know whether to be surprised by that. I don't, know, I don't know what I'm doing. So if you can, elicit that. Second strategy, let them surprise themselves. So people say, oh, these quizzes, it's just about narcissistic uh, desires to be a part of the process. I think it's something much more interesting and deeper. We need to be surprised. So Pew Research does a lot of good things. What who shares your views on race? You answer the question, and then it says, OK, here's what our survey showed. A majority of adults agree with you. Here are what the, the polls say. So it's letting you be surprised, like, oh, I, I said this, and they're all saying that. So you're bringing that element of surprise in there. I wish that we had something where you could go to a website and say, OK, surprise me. Give me something <laughs> that you just that you're not anticipating. Give me something new and crazy. All right, go from the unfamiliar, another strategy, to familiar surprise. Chances of me dying in a car crash, one out of 9,000. A victim of domestic terrorism, one out of 3,200,000. So again, I don't know what to do with these numbers. I know this is smaller than this. Uh, but uh, you know, sometimes people get confused. If there's a bigger number on the bottom, they don't know if they probability is bigger. Um, so what if I told you that chances of me dying in a car crash um, is equivalent to me predicting correctly 13 coin flips in advance? So if I were to sit here and, or have 13 of you and say, OK, I'm going to guess they're all heads, and then you flip, it, it could come up all heads, right? Pretty rare. That's the equivalent to 9,000, one out of 9,000. So this is interesting because there's research that shows our brains don't work on a linear scale when it comes to numbers, that it works on a log scale, that we need that the magnitude difference between this and this we don't really have a conception of. So I'm breaking it down into something that's very, um, uh, again, the natural numbers, things that are in our world that we can see and understand, all right? So domestic terrorism would be equivalent to flipping 21 coins and getting 21 heads. I can feel the difference a little bit more now. So these um, it's called surprisals to be able to work on this. And I like this idea because we can always come back to, all right, I'm going to run this random experiment. I can, I can actually flip coins. I can see what it feels like. Last strategy. All else fails, use your words. So I'll never guess what happened. Clickbait. We turn our nose up at clickbait. It is actually, it's, it's 
telling us you're about to be surprised. So if you can't elicit their expectations or let them be surprised or communicate something in a human-centered way about surprise, just tell them. And as scientists, we tend to say, oh, uh, I, can't, I can't give opinions. I can't talk about surprise in here. And I feel like we're cheating our, our audience. We, we, a whopping, is that, is that a lot? Maybe without the whopping, I wouldn't know that an 80% increase is, is a lot. You'll never guess what happened. Now. Oh, that's right. I'm about to be surprised. I'm prepared for it. Exclamation points. Oh, we're taught not to use them. They are uh, mere activity, what linguists use to refer to how surprised I am. Suddenly, this is a great one. You can use that. That's not too emotional. In American Sign Language, surprise is a huge element. And at first, I was very frustrated because uh, 3x you know, plus 2 equals 6. Um, well, wait a minute. It always is. Like, I would have to go through, and then at the end, I would have to surprise the answer. And uh, there's no surprise to that. Mm -hmm. it, it always is. When I first learned ASL, I was very frustrated. But I realize now it's getting to this. Like, OK, wait a minute. You're going to get something. You're about to get new information that I want you to embed within yourself. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But Natalie Andrew at New York Times did a terrific job of this. Um, so look at how she brings this in. They were astonished to discover um, that continuity should astonish us. Um, they were impressed. Uh, even greater concentrations. Uh, here she has a good quote. I didn't think bacteria were so self-destructive. How did we miss it all these years? Just a surprising thing happened in the lab. Or even no surprise. So um, surprise or no surprise, I want to have that. So it's no surprise. OK, you're telling me right, this, is, this is what people already know. This is good. I already know this. This I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, I love this quote. I was expecting something completely off the wall and different. But there are frightening, fascinating overlaps with mammalian milk. All right, so hold on to that mammalian milk. But anyway, she does a terrific job of being lively, but also leading readers along on this, on this evidence. OK, so last one. Bring it back home to the here and the now after we've gone on this. They're talking about evidence, talking about uncertainty. And I, I think of it as we took readers or audience on this journey, but somehow we have to bring them back home. We have to do something with it. And I want them to be changed somehow by this experience. Something's changed. Something in their perspective. So statisticians are people who love their stats class. We have the word form of uh, Bayes' theorem on top. Prior knowledge, new evidence, updated knowledge. But really, it's, it's what we're talking about here. Expectation, somehow, getting people to the expectation, plus surprise, that new evidence that I'm talking about. Surprise, uncertainty, what's going on there? That's what gives us change, whether it's a change in perspective or um, decision making, something that we need to do. This, this is what we're after, right? When we're working with our audience, we're not just telling them disembodied facts. We want to connect with them. We need to tell them the change. And I decided that SciComm is one giant change my mind booth. I'm still using prior beliefs and expectations. Change my mind. I haven't actually seen this one. I feel like I feel like we should all go out. Do they still have them here? I think they. I still have these booths. I love this. Change my mind. Tell me why I should update my knowledge. Tell me why new information is coming in. So there are different ways of doing this. Uh, Christy Schwanden is a terrific uh, health and science journalist. And she wrote a great piece that's a number of years ago. But she's saying, OK, women deserve to know these numbers. So yeah, it's hard. So. The, she asked a clinician, you know, what, what advice should women have mammograms? And the clinician is saying, no, I don't know. And it's true that the science is difficult, but there's a more helpful way to answer this question. Let's get in and help people, give them the evidence, give them the surprise so they can make the decision, bring it back home to the, the here and now for them. And as I was talking about with the mammalian milk, I love this. I recommend uh, this. Uh, from last year, 
Um, she starts off, the lead is talking about these fly larvae. And um, you, can, you can puncture them, and you know all this gross stuff comes out. It was, um, so she's going on and on about these flies. How similar it was to the product of the beloved gland that stamps us as mammals. So she talked about cockroach milk and uh, fly milk and flamingo milk, which, by the way, is pink and um, looks like cottage cheese. So she said, look at all these other things. So rather than having just abstractions about all these animals, and it would be weird enough to have cockroaches with milk, but she says, all right, this tells us something about being human. So she's not asking for a decision here, but she's helping to change our perspective about what it means to be a mammal and a human in this whole animal kingdom. All right, last one. So uh, when I wrote for the LA Times, I briefly wrote a column called The Mating Game, uh, The Science of Mating, Dating, and Sex. And this was kicked off because I wrote uh, a very long feature article about the neuroscience of orgasms which, as you might imagine, was rather popular. And um, it was fun because I got to give the evidence story. People will sit still for the dirty you know, pans in the kitchen if uh, there's sex along the way. Um, <laughs> so bringing it back to the here and now, this, I didn't actually write about this, but I think this is a perfect example of, I'm going to put in a little bit statistics, to emphasize effect size instead of p-values when you're talking about work. All right, so this is the, the Reuters piece, and based on the, uh, the press release, so they were testing a nasal gel, a testosterone nasal gel that women use who have anorgasmia. So there's no pink Viagra for women, and a shocking number of women report this at some time in their lives, and there's, there's no like pharmaceutical really solution. They're still looking for this sort of thing. So they develop, so you can take pills, but it tends to, you know, you grow facial hair because you got testosterone, you know, systemically. So they have this as needed uh, gel that you snort uh, up your nose and before you're about to have a sexual encounter. So they were testing this, different dosages compared uh, to a placebo. And uh, so notice what they're saying, statistically significant increase compared with a placebo. That's it. So I'm just, uh, I'm just trusting them here now, right? There's no bringing this home for me. There's no uncertainty. So you have to dig into the, uh, the um, you know, the, the company information. Finally, you say, okay, 35% higher response. Okay, well, again, we've talked about what happened 35%. Who wouldn't want that, right? Mm -hmm. so, and then finally, we get down to 84-day treatment period, 2.3 orgasms in the treatment group versus 1.7 in the placebo arm. Okay, this is finally, we're getting somewhere, but let's, let's see what we can do with this, with this effect size rather than focusing on the p-value. So we've got mean orgasms in the treatment group and the placebo group, so now we can say 0.6 extra orgasms between the two groups. It's not a lot, right? It, it sounds a whole lot less impressive than 35% increase, doesn't it? Which is why you had to hunt to find this information. Also notice, so to be a part of the placebo group, you had to have reported no orgasms, I think in the past six months or a year or something like that. Ooh, now all of a sudden placebo, 1.7. <laughs> Maybe a placebo is a better way to go. You don't have to worry about facial hair or side effects. Okay, what can, so you're looking at this. My question would be 0.6, Extra orgasms, oh, okay, over 12 weeks, right? 0.6 per year, per day, you know, per day is something different. What's our baseline? Okay, 12 weeks. Um, how often do they have sex, right? Is it like once every 12 weeks, once a month? Uh, okay, mean number of sexual encounters in the study, 15. Right, so we're starting to put it together. Can we go a little more? <laughs> mean number of testosterone snorts, one extra orgasm, 25. So, 
this is bringing it home, I feel, right? This is the here and now. This is me and my body. And you're not, you're not telling them, okay, this is worth it or it's not worth it, right? One extra orgasm. Maybe that one extra orgasm was very important. I'm not going to tell women what they should and should not have. 25, maybe that, that's worth it. But you're bringing it back into something. Notice how this is a very different story than statistically significant increase in orgasms or even 35% increase. But okay, this is, this is it. This puts it in perspective. Now I know. So there, um, this is a few years ago, and the clinical trials on this have um, stalled, unfortunately. And yes, this is gratuitous use of sex, um, <laughs> but I, I am not above that. I feel like it made the point. So, but it was still gratuitous, but uh, I felt like you needed a reward um, to be able to get you through all of this. All right, so let's uh, close. So my dream is human-centered quantitative communication where we're being very um, understanding and loving towards these brains and realizing what they need. They need numbers in a human-centered way. They need an evidence story so I know how do we know this. They need uncertainty couched appropriately. They need surprise. They definitely need surprise. And they need something to wrap it all up together. So if you will also uh, permit me one last indulgent thing. So quantification, tiny brain computer. All right, so this, my word recognition, uh, in a, they have this thing in a very noisy environment. So it's like in a, in a bar. And then they throw these sentences. And uh, at you, and uh, so before surgery, 6%. That tells you it wasn't really getting very much. This is why parties were hard. One month after, 2%. I told you it was hard. That was that mind-blowing thing. I worked at it and worked and worked. 46% after one year, 86% after two years. So I'm still shooting for 126% because <laughs> I don't understand. Percentages very well, but I might as well shoot for the stars. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you guys. Can you just speak a little more about what it's like teaching at Gallaudet? How long have you taught there? And what's, your, what, what's the biggest difference mm. between teaching for hearing students? There are so many differences. Pedagogically, it's very interesting. We don't have, um, we, I'm sorry, I was supposed to repeat that. The, the question is um, for the, whatever, the, the recording. Uh, what is it like to teach at Gallaudet? And what are the, the big differences there? So everything is visually centered. Everything is very concrete. So we don't have rows. We don't have auditorium styles like this. Everything we're sitting where we can see each other. And I feel like this makes for a much more immediate personal experience than this. So I can see who's nodding. You all can't see who's nodding or is looking disgusted or puzzled or whatever, right? You're not, you're not feeling connected uh, with the audience in, the, in quite the same way. Also, teaching statistics in ASL um, American Sign Language does not have vocabulary for a lot of statistics terms. So this is challenging. It also is a very concrete language. So it's four dimensions, right? So three dimensions plus time. Um, but it needs to be something that you can see. So I'm fascinated by this. Standard deviation, what would, I know I said no stats, but what's the most important concept about standard deviation that you would like to encapsulate in, in a sign? Right? Like, we're stuck with the word in English, right? I know. So sometimes we'll, um, we'll um, try to sign, like, what the equation looks like. Or, you know, we, those of us that learn the, the normal, you know, we're trying to do this sort of thing. Is, is that the most important thing? Well, not, not everything is normal. So it's not, you know, always, always going like this. That's just one example. Mean. So the, the sign for mean and median and average were all the same. So I said, no, 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 we have to do something about this. <laughs> and I cannot have this. Um, do, do you just finger spell it? Like, what's, what's this? So I think it's fascinating to think conceptually about the ideas and probability and statistics and what's underlying that. 
you know, and, and what do I want to throw up in the air? At first I thought, as soon as I learn all the vocabulary in ASL, then everything's going to be easy. And then I realized it's not about that. It's about how you're thinking in this very visual, four-dimensional way. And so this has changed my uh, view of how to communicate information, to be able to get down to what is that nugget, what is that heart, and what is as concrete as possible. Like, how can you get down? When we're speaking in English, it's easy. We, uh, we ride on this uh, stream of verbiage, right? And I'm trusting that you can make those connections then. I'm using different terms, and you're connecting it all the way down. So imagine we don't have all of this up here, and I have to get down here. What, what are the ideas that I'm tr really trying to get across? ASL is also interesting uh, because it has a lot of embodied cognition in there. So I, it, like, like gut feeling. You talk about um, a gut feeling or um, pride. This looks like pride, doesn't it? Sad. So it, it, you know, up and down, and that affects how you're communicating information because there's often an emotional component on top of. The, even the lack of vocabulary, there's a, you need to put in that surprise and that emotion. It was very difficult for me as a statistician. I wanted to just give the facts as they are. And now I realize I need to embed them in a story. I need to tell people what to expect. So those are a couple of things. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. So the, the question was the, the Matsi's tribe, and there are, there are others that have more or less evidentiality kind of baked into it. They have to choose a verb form. So like we have to choose a verb form that conjugates with um, uh, the, like the plurality of the, the speaker or the, the, the object. They have to choose a verb form or markers or suffixes, you know, and, and prefixes that give that information, whether it's hearsay, whether I experienced it. And it's closely related with that narrativity that I was talking about because, um, okay, this is how I know it, but how surprised am I mm -hmm. by me knowing it, right? So that's important also. We use it informally in English, but then somehow we freeze up when we, when we write professionally or we communicate and we don't put that in there. And so I'm fascinated. I'm not saying that we should... Uh, you know, change our verb forms. But it's good to remember that um, at some level, that was serving a purpose. And what have we lost in the efficiency of getting rid of all those, those suffixes? Did that answer your question? Yeah, uh, yeah, um, uh, linguistics. So the, the studies that have suggested it's um, due to trust, those are still preliminary, and these groups are, you know, they're, they're hard to study, and, uh, but uh, linguistically, yes, some have them more than, more than others. So we use it a little bit in English, apparently. We say, apparently. So this, apparently, this, it, that means I haven't experienced it. Maybe I haven't studied it. But apparently, someone I'm trusting has said this, right? So we, we put it in there, um, but it's not required in English. So what do we know now, I mean, about the way we tell the story? And maybe I'm putting too much in this hand basket, but do we know how better that is at overcoming cognitive dissonance, the people who just don't want to believe what you're talking about. Do, do we know that the story works better that way? Um, the, so the question is, what do we know about trying to reach people who don't want to believe? Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's very complicated, right? Because then we're starting to talk about um, uh, individual identity and tribal identity and who I'm identifying with and all the, the emotions and the personal things I have in there. This is why I like what Honora O'Neill is talking about, uh, which is on a daily basis, we learn how to signal trust to other people. Can we bring that back in a more institutional level? 
And yes, there will be people who take advantage of that trust, and there will be people who are signaling trust and wondering what it's for, because I'm just I'm being transparent and I'm putting it out there. But I think that her point is, well, first of all, we want trust where it should be. We want intelligent trust. So I just don't want to increase trust in all science, science, right? Um, I, I want everyone to show their evidence and their trustworthiness and help people learn that this is what they need to do. They need to come to expect that sort of thing. It's the same thing with uncertainty. I think we need to help our audiences understand the added value of admitting what we don't know. Um, because in the short term, yes, it's those people who are claiming that they have no uncertainty that are getting ahead, right? You know, because, well, it's a sure thing. In the long run, it's the people who are very transparent and obvious and vulnerable about what it is they know and don't know that will have the long-term trust. So it uh, kind of answers your question. It, it's obviously very complicated. But. OK, anybody else? Oh, oh my gosh, that's so high tech. I have another question. <laughs> How can we best tailor a science narrative story to an audience mixed of both general and professional observers? Ooh, that's a good question. So general and professional observers, how can we uh, tailor our science story for them? Uh, yeah, that, that's hard. So I haven't talked too much about audience in here. I've just been talking about humans and, and Stone Age uh, brain. Uh, obviously, you're not going to be able to satisfy people who are coming in here expecting us to talk about p-values and regression um, and people who don't want any numbers at all. Um, but it's also a cop-out to say, uh, well, we just need to uh, stratify all our audiences and, you know, we have a... Uh, we have an admission test before we come in. I, I do think it would be fun. It's tempting, right? Um, I can say that it's never wrong to aim um, uh, too basic at this human element. So, of course, I can handle 35% increase or 0.52 versus 0.41, right? Like, we can do that. But also, I recognize at some fundamental level, I like that five and four out of a thousand. So can I start with that? And then iterate around, right? And then circle around and then build on top of it. And fine, I might lose some people along the way, but at least I've started out with this fundamental basis and I've brought even experts in who might not have thought about it in this way, right? Because they're too busy intellectualizing what's going on. Um, that would be my immediate answer to that without thinking about it too much. If anyone else has an answer to that, I'd love to hear it. So for example, when I wrote about p-values for nature, um, uh, statisticians have been writing for decades about abuses and misunderstandings for p-values. And I wrote for what I considered to be a, an intelligent undergraduate audience. And uh, it, it resonated with people because it was plain language and I was telling a story and it was conversational and colloquial. And I think, yeah, I can, I can handle all these other things, but that doesn't mean there's not a place for that uh, much more basic information. Why did you choose statistics or did statistics choose you? Oh, good question. Did I choose statistics or did it choose me? So I did um, industrial engineering for my undergraduate because I knew I could get a job and I didn't like working in a lab. Um, I love the idea that you can organize the universe, right? The universe is really messy and uncertain and confusing and I love this idea that Okay, you can, uh, you can make sense of it. Even though you can't really, then I learned that there's, you know, basically what we do is just quantify uncertainty. But at the, at the time, it, it seemed like um, I was going to get all the answers. So I'm falling prey to the same cognitive biases that I say we need to avoid. Now I'm fascinated because it is this grammar of science and we can understand the scientific process by understanding statistics. Time for one more question. 
for you too, but if I have one, it's yeah. um, I'm curious, I mean, your job, I assume you also work sometimes with these elected officials, and so I'm wondering, do you find they have similar uh, patterns, or how do you deal differently sharing this kind of data with elected officials or government officials as opposed to, say, lay people? I'm going to ask you to repeat that because you're a little far away. Yeah, so uh, the question was basically, uh, have you ever worked with elected officials, and then how do you find that they interpret data differently than just a lay person? Oh, good question. Um, I've never personally worked with elected officials, uh, so I guess that would be the, uh, the most transparent answer. Not last time I checked. <laughs> Anything other than that would be speculation. Uh, <laughs> um, Uncertainty is the real is the real problem there. Of course, they want the, the tasty chocolate cake. You know, they they need that. Uh, so how can we sneak in that information? And that's why I think in the study of science communication, if we studied how to communicate the added value of uncertainty to help people buy into the idea that okay, you might not like the broccoli or whatever, you know, but it's good for you, and you'll eventually develop a taste for it. If we can help. That, that's why I say the un uncertainty sandwich, like, you know, kind of couch it appropriately. But if we can find a better way of selling that to general audiences and having them come to expect that where they get a little skeptical, um, if they're not getting that uncertainty, then that will become a habit. And, and I think it would uh, help with uh, how we're approaching science rather than them getting frustrated that we have uh, coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you, good for you, bad, right? Like I understand, no, things are just, beliefs are nudging. We have, we have new evidence along the way. So that, that's a little way from the, the lawmakers, but uh, it's the, uh, they're, just, they're just the public with a bigger voice, that's all, right? <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Regina. Thank you so much. <laughs>